least the hardest part is to wake up in the morning and go. I, I, yeah. I don't, by the way, right? <laughs> Three, two, one. It's showtime. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Backstage <laughs> Plus show, the show where we go behind the scenes of various different media projects. Uh, my guest today is, uh, sorry if I butcher your name, Pedro. I, I just say Pedro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe you could introduce yourself. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Yes, my name is very similar to that. It's Pedro. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Argentina. And right now I'm working on a video game called Synth Hunters. Um, but other than that, I work with VFX, making 3D graphics, animations, and stuff like that. Mm. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the game you're working on? Yes, right now I'm making an RPG game. Uh, it is voxel art. Style, not voxel technology like Minecraft and stuff like that, but voxel looking, right? Mm -hmm. um, which for those who don't know, that's like a 3D pixel art. And I'm mm. doing that independently at the moment. I'm designing all the characters, the story, and the assets, everything very, very slowly uh, on the hopes to get funding eventually and start working with a professional team that will help me develop it in a more professional manner, right? I'm, I'm aiming from something of a double A game, like not a super amazing game, a triple A like GTA mm. or something like that. And also not like a homemade game, something in between of those two things. Okay. Well, how, I guess the big question is, how did you get from this point? You've worked as a visual effects artist for a couple of movies before how did you go from working for movies and i think also making your own short film to uh working on a game so yeah when i was about 17 i started learning 3d and then i got a job on a studio uh, doing advertisement i did that for like eight years doing animation and 3d models and stuff like that and then i moved from south america to london to start working with films instead of advertisements. So I had wanted a bit of a change uh, and I figured that that would be cool. And in between that change from South America to, to Europe, but it's no longer in the European Union, but whatever, <laughs> I started making a short film because the job that I do is very technical, right? Like creating hyper-realistic 3D models or hyper-realistic looking backgrounds and stuff like that. So there was not a lot of room for creativity, let's say, right? Mm. So I wanted to explore a bit more of that and that's why I wanted to make a short film. So I wanted to see if I had some creativity in me, <laughs> basically. Uh, so I started doing that. It took me around four years to make it. Um, and then this short film made me realize that I really like doing those kind of things. And when we, when I, when I did the film, basically I finished it and that got the attention of a production company called Atlas V, Atlas five. Mm -hmm. And they helped me distribute this film in festivals, which was something that I didn't even know about, right? I made the film just to make it. And then I discovered this world of uh, film festivals and stuff like that, where people submit their films and everybody goes to watch it on cinema screens and it's for independent creators. So there's a lot of space for you to create something and, and really put it out there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed that. And of course, after like a small success with my short film, um, I f felt, you know, like I needed to keep doing it to make another film, but honestly, something happened that I started thinking about making a video game. I, I always played video games and I always wanted to make, to make one, right? But I of course didn't know how to, but I was really excited about the idea. So I started exploring it more and it was kind of a, like a burning passion that I couldn't like, uh, put down, you know, I just wanted to do it. And I figured that I didn't need to change careers. I could just do it as a side project the same way I did my short film. I did all the short film as I was working. So it's not that I quit my job or anything like that to do mm. it. So that's how it came about. I really wanted to do it and start exploring more and more. And 
yeah, eventually it became a real thing. So yeah, these people, uh, Atlas Five, when when they heard that I was uh, doing uh, this game idea, that I was posting stuff on Instagram, and people started following me a bit, they said like, why don't we work on this project together from the beginning instead of like waiting until you finish or something to distribute it, you know? And yeah, that's that's the path that I took to to get to to seriously make the video game, basically. So the Atlas V, they, how how do I have to understand? Did they f help you fund the game, or how how what did they do? So basically, what what they they are a production company from France, mm -hmm. and what they do is uh, they know how to create documents that you can submit to participate in government funds, basically. Oh. So, you know, you know, those processes are super bureaucratic and mm -hmm. it requires for you to fill forms and have contracts and this and that. So it's very complex. It's, it's a complex and <laughs> very boring project that most people that are <laughs> on the creative side uh, don't really want to even know about, you know. And um, mm. not only that, but they also have uh, submitted things on the past, so they are known on the industry so that really helps a lot when it comes to basically what, what the government what they want is to make sure that if they give you money you won't misuse it right and if you and if they gave you money before and you used it properly then you're more trusted so it's not the same if you want to submit yourself which you could do but if you have the backing of a studio mm -hmm. and that they know and everything it becomes a bit more a bit easier so not, not only that but they also have a bit more uh, know-how on the steps you need to take, what things you need to look at. And, and it was um, a very humbling process that was amazing for me because, of course, like everybody else, when, when you start uh, thinking about a project, you dream big and you want to make the next GTA, the next super massive online game with super mm -hmm. graphics and everything. But then when you start looking and, and trying to understand what that entails, what, what that means, you realize that it's impossible to make. And, and even then, it's hard to grasp how much money does it cost, what's the budget you should think of. It's very hard. And they, for me, really what was amazing because they helped me uh, understand a lot of things. And they, for instance, put me in contact with actual game designers that I would pitch my game to them and they would tell me, this is totally impossible to make this is possible maybe focus most on more on these maybe try to f to understand better what kind of game you want to make and and honestly the game that we were planning right now is totally different to the game that i originally started with very generic question but uh, i guess which games did inspire you or did you maybe find inspiration outside of uh, video games like movies or anything like that um Honestly, originally I was um, very into a game, an Argentine game called Argentum Online. Argentum Online. Um, Argentum and Online. It is a very old school MMORPG made in Argentina that right now came back and, and the people, uh, the original team is remaking it and it's looking amazing. It's very fun. It is an MMORPG. Uh, of the kind that when you die you drop all your items and I wanted something like that lots of PvP if you die you draw your up you, you drop your items and um, also I really like games like Rust I really like online competitive games but turns out that online competitive games are probably the, the most expensive and complex oh, kind yeah. of game that you can probably want to make and that, that's what I wanted to make I really quickly realized that it was not happening mm -hmm. um, so yeah I needed to I needed to adapt it and right now it became a um, more of an offline game a uh, co-op with multiplayer where I put a lot of emphasis on the gameplay right it is a bit of a gamers game like you need to do combos and swap weapons mm -hmm. and combine those weapons clever in clever ways to kill your enemies and, and it's like fast-paced combat but on a more uh, like offline uh, co uh, mm -hmm. cooperative right yeah and so taking out the hardest part of the development i guess which is the, on the online part. 
Yeah, the, the impossible yeah. part, yeah. <laughs> not not yeah. the hardest, it's the impossible uh, one. Of like course. The, the Nintendo Online sucks. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I just recently played a game online on Nintendo and it, it lagged a lot. <laughs> so yeah, uh -huh. if, uh, if not even Nintendo is able to do it, you can't expect uh, a one-man army to do it. Oh, it's crazy. And and not only not only the technical side of programming it that is more complicated already on its own, but also is paying for a server that is not cheap, having people playing it that is hard for any independent project, right? Like that's the problem of uh, MMORPGs. If there's not a lot of people playing it, then you go into a world that is basically empty and you have nothing to do. Mm. So it is a lot of things that are, that go on top of making that that will make it more complicated so so that's why i took a step back maybe one day in the future uh so your game again is a voxel art right what are some limitations that voxel art has that um i guess regular 3d doesn't like especially in terms of design what what you have to pay attention to well something that happens to me when i'm trying to make stuff for the game uh, in voxel art is that sometimes i i come up or i think of something that i feel it would be a cool design but when you try to make it with very few voxels it is not always that you will get that instant read that you look at it and you know what it is so that is mm -hmm. something that is quite limiting yeah uh, so it, it has less less detail so you can't recognize it as easily right yeah, I mean, so sometimes I just don't manage to create an object that you look at it and you know what it is. Uh, some other times mm. it works great and it's like super simple and looks good and looks like design and also recognizable and, and everything. Uh, but sometimes, yeah, I just cannot work around it. I end up scrapping some ideas because I just mm. don't find the design for it. Because I'm working with with very few voxels, right? Mm. So yeah, yeah that, that's a big limitation. You kind of build your community with the voxel art thing, right? You have like the Instagrams and you do tutorials as well. And I think yeah. I can see on the Discord, a lot of people on the Discord are fans specifically of voxel art. So I guess what is your yeah. strat what is it like your strategy to building a community? I try to, I, I use mainly Instagram. It's the only thing that I managed to figure out how to kind of figure it out. Um, and basically what I do is I go to relevant hashtags to my to my game, like voxel art, like art, like illustration, 3D, animation, stuff like that. And I try to engage with accounts in Instagram, right? And maybe mm -hmm. liking posts, uh, leaving a comment, uh, dropping a direct message. Uh, making sure that they are aware that I exist and that my brand <laughs> exists. Yeah. And and hopefully from 10 people that I engage with, one will go into my profile, like the game, and some of those will then uh, see that I have a Discord community and go uh, check it out. And then the other side of it is I'm all the time trying to produce value for the people that potentially will follow me and for this i mean making a tutorial that will help them create their own voxel art i have a mentoring channel on my discord server where you can mm. just go in and talk with me about your project and i will tell you what i know maybe i can help you with something and um, so a lot of things that because especially because as the game right now is on on more of a design step is we are not programming we don't have gameplay or demo or anything to start showing i need to keep these people entertained with something right like if my mm -hmm. server was about my game there would be not much to talk about like yeah great after one month like you just have to wait for updates right so in there i have channels for them to uh, post stuff about their own work and we criticize each other's artworks and we uh, encourage ourselves to to create more things and and there are community challenges sometimes so a place to hang out to make friends so it needs to be something that goes beyond uh, the game if you don't mm. have it very advanced right so I, I i see a lot of people uh, i simply 
focusing hyper focusing on on creating the game and forgetting that if people are not aware that your game exists mm -hmm. nobody will play it when it's out yeah and i you guess publish it on steam and that day is the most important right i guess the you maybe i could phrase it this way is that you provide value more than just through your game and that way people pay more attention to your game as well right maybe if you have a game that is very advanced people can just be entertained uh, by seeing you creating the game and that's also value right it's not that they need mm. to learn something they just need to be entertained somehow and mm -hmm. that's something that you need to come up as an, as an independent developer right marketing yeah. is 50 percent of your project yes and with that we're about halfway through so i will shift to the sponsor segment <laughs> I do not there have I, I do not have a sponsor, uh, but if you are a company and you would like to sponsor this show, you can contact me at backstagepluspodcast at gmail .com. That is backstagepluspodcast at gmail .com. I also have a Patreon in case anyone wants to uh, keep this project alive this way. And uh, I thought maybe I would give it a try and do one of these donation goal thingies. Uh, I'm I'm trying to get a microphone arm for a little bit better audio. Maybe someone wants to donate. Okay, back to the podcast. <laughs> nice. And your avatar disappeared. <laughs> no, it's it's back. All right. Nice. Uh, next question. Let me see. <laughs> kind of touched upon this before, but what are sort of your design principles when it comes to designing the characters and enemies for your game? You have to set a set of rules for your universe, right? That mm. where the game happens, what's your game and uh, the things that exist in this world that you're creating. For my game, uh, the things that I try to have is uh, sci-fi looking objects. They need to be kind of evocative of a 90s feel. So it's like a retro futuristic kind of thing. They need to have, if possible, some humorous tone to it right so these and some extra rules imagine you have 10 rules so when you're making something you have to at least hit most of your rules those are the objects that i create and i say like this is perfect for the game and um, in my case for instance i don't know i have a gun that is made out of a walkman like a cassette like a cassette player Mm -hmm. but it's also like a retro cassette player and it's called the sound blaster so it shoots like a like a note when it shoots it sounds like a bit like a note so it's, it's a bit it's a lot of things condensed into one object that i'm creating right so trying to find like a funny twist to these classic rpg elements that that we all know and love and trying to give them my own touch and 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 a bit of these um try to be like something that you open and you say like ah this is different this is fun this is like a nice twist to it so different question how do you come up with weapons for your game because i remember i think you mentioned it you have very interesting weapons like the what was it the choke cola gun <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah following these rules i try to think like for instance okay 90s gadget or popular culture items oh. that everybody recognized, right? So I start, like, I go into Pinterest and I Google and I pin and I search for gadgets, 90s gadgets. And then I find uh, the Walkman, right? That I think that it looks very nice. Then I start thinking, how do I turn this into a weapon or an item for the game that could do something for the game, right? I have like a very, I call it the shotgun approach, which is whatever comes to my mind, I try to make it. And then I see if I can use it or if it makes sense for the game or or what I do with it, right? And if it doesn't work for the game, I save it on a different folder and one day maybe I use it for a future pro for a future project. And sometimes something that I did like a month ago brings a new idea or I combine two things and it ends up being like something that I can actually use. So I try not to limit myself too much by the rules. I try to make stuff and then adapt it more and more until it hit all of the boxes that I like and then I consider it mm -hmm. to be incorporated into the game. So yeah, I, I want these things to 
to be stuff that you can recognize that, that you can say like, oh, I had one of those when I was a kid, like this toy that this gun is made out of, you know, um, like, I don't know, I have one of the, one of my characters has a hel a helmet that is a Viewmaster. I don't know if you remember this very old toy is called Viewmaster that was like a disc of uh, negatives that you just could see it was like a Disney toy or something. Then when you see it, if you, if you don't know it, it looks nice. And if you know it, that has that extra layer that helps you relate to the game. Like, I know that thing. I know this reference. I know it. What is the most difficult part of making your game? The hardest part is to wake up in the morning and go. I, yeah. I, I don't, by the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I constantly fail on that. So, so that's the hardest part. Like, sit down and start working and try to be mm -hmm. um, as constant as you can. I guess that's what is the training you know once you get that and you start doing it every day it just becomes easier and easier and you just go but but yeah keeping motivation is very hard my personal strategy to motivation is uh, that i try to make things as easy as possible for me for example with exercise i realized going to the gym is not for me <laughs> unless i have like a maybe i have a gym buddy that helps a lot because then I feel responsible for going to the gym because someone else wants me to go there with them. Or another strategy I found, another thing I found is uh, I like riding the bicycle a lot more than exercising, right? So it, it's more fun, right. so I, I need less motivation. So yeah, that's, I, that, that's great. So the, the, I think for me, the strategy at least is to make it as easy as possible for yourself. So you actually, so you don't need to rely on motivation at all definitely yeah yeah i think finding the thing that gets you to do and do a lot of that right mm. yeah that that's that's crucial yeah i agree i agree quick question how do you come up with these names like Coca cola and farta <laughs> <laughs> so um there's there's a lot of uh, back and forth uh, on the server and with the community that i that i gather over time um i generally post the, the ideas that I have and they give me their feedback. I figure if they, if it's fun for them or not. And then, I don't know, I try to, to make it as close as possible to something that already exists. Like, I don't know, the choke cola is just adding that age. The, the uh, choke gun? To, right. To go from coke to choke. I just added that age and it's like mm -hmm. a minimum uh, transformation to make it not be coca-cola and get sued and also <laughs> it's something that is fun or funny and so yeah it, it's, it's just like sitting down and thinking like okay what do i name this what what is mm. what are the uh, the elements of this asset for instance right it's a gun it's made out of coca-cola so it needs to be something uh, like that i don't know the, the one that has like a coca-cola as a silencer uh, oh originally that was, was yeah the first one this one, right. Yeah. Originally, it was a Coca-Cola, like a normal Coke, the red one. But mm -hmm. then it, I thought it's a silencer, so maybe it's a calorie silencer. So then I <laughs> changed it to a Diet Coke. So I constantly try to adapt it. So maybe maybe the name changes the design of the of the asset, right? Just to have more of it. Like if, if I don't find it, I will just call it whatever. It's fine. But if but I tr always try to just add that extra layer. If the name is funny and the object is cleverly designed and it looks nice uh well that's a perfect asset for the game mm. if it's just good then great right you also mm -hmm. made one of your uh one of your characters as like an a physical toy once right is that like a, i guess like a hobby you had before or is that something that came out of this project to make so, I guess, physical models as well i think when I started creating my characters and the simplicity of them opened a lot of doors creatively because when something is simple, it's simple to produce mm. on a lot of ways, right? So being that I have simple square looking characters, I figured that there's a lot of potential to make toys and, and other kinds of merchandise uh, with the intellectual property that I'm generating. Well, since you've worked on a couple of games, uh, vi not video games, uh, f films before movies. Mm -hmm. What is the favorite film you've worked on and why? Right, right, right. So 
uh, for the people that don't know, I used to work, uh, right now I resigned this work and I'm working as a freelance for advertisement, but I, uh, before that I was working doing films for a studio called Framestore and we worked in like Marvel films and, and big films like that. Mm -hmm. um, so honestly, the process of making those films is super technical and super slow and it is something like you make whatever you're making. I was making environments, which means like 3D scenarios or, or mm -hmm. so, you know, when you have the character and they are on a green screen, whatever goes behind that green screen, like a city, a forest, a mountain, whatever. That's what I was working on with the team of people, right? So imagine we were making a mountain. Um, so I would just model a mountain over the course of a week or something. And then I, you publish that and it goes to a little cinema where there's the technical director that sees this, uh, this project, this, 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 what I, that you're working on. And they will tell you like this pixel here, I would like it a bit more clear. This other hmm. piece of the mountain up here. So it's months and months of you going back and forth, perfecting it and perfecting it. So the processes of the films really blend, blend in a lot. I would say that the ones that I enjoyed the most was the ones that I was not hyper-focusing on one mountain, but I was working more of a bigger mm -hmm. environment. And, and that happened, for instance, in Thor Ragnarok. That was very fun to make. We made like mm -hmm. the whole city when the characters are like on a bridge and you see this uh, big building that is uh, all made out of gold and all that city behind it, that's what we were working on. And it was lots of fun just making all the different parts of it. But honestly, something I really enjoyed about that work was that it was uh, somehow was like very glamorous, you know, like when I, I worked, for instance, in Avengers Endgame and Infinity War. And I really like how people get excited when they under, when they learn that I participated in, in these kind of films. You mm -hmm. know? So I guess that that was that was like the most fun because after finishing it, I kept hearing about people like really enjoying the film and really liking the, the bits that I that I participated on. So yeah, I, I guess that's the most fun for me part of that work because I'm not the most technical guy, right? So mm -hmm. then like, I enjoy uh, I more to as step like, back uh, and see the final sorry. product. <laughs> Uh, yeah. As like a, as a viewer of uh, movies, what which movie did you enjoy the most out of the ones you worked on? Honestly, I haven't watched all of the movies that I worked <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> because funny enough, I'm not the biggest fan of superhero movies. I just really oh, yeah. enjoy not, not me participating either. and making it. Uh, but yeah, I haven't I haven't really watched probably sixty percent of the ones I I worked on. Fair enough. But yeah, yeah um, I really enjoy like really boring movies, old movies, and uh, <laughs> I love psychological thrillers and stuff like that. <laughs> mm. But wow, let me think. Um, yeah, probably Thor Ragnarok. It, it was just mm -hmm. so cool to. Well, honestly, no. I, I, I worked in the first uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And I remember that was the first film I worked on when I first arrived into London. And I remember mm. going to the cinema and first of all, like being exposed to all of these hyper talented people because they bring everybody that is the best around the world. They bring it, they bring them and they put them to work together in these films, right? Of course, there are people that are not so amazing. There's a lot of people that are super juniors and they are super incredible seniors and i'm talking about like these masterminds of the vfx right and seeing their work for the first time from the inside was so exciting to me so new uh, and when i went to the cinema and watched the film seeing my shots on the screen was really uh you know i i would never re forget that I, I guess that has this emotional value to me mm -hmm. um the movie can be better or worse whatever but seeing my name on the yeah. credits when the movie finished like mm -hmm. that's pretty unforgettable that made it all worth mm. it 